Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 10 today, and I, I wanted to take uh, a minute to start off by just saying this. Um, back at our, our vision night, we shared uh, these elements that we feel like God is pressing us into as a church, to be a, a devoted people. That's why we would do a, something like a prayer room, learning how to pray, learning how to come to the feet of Jesus and present ourselves to him to be a dependent people, learning how to grow in our dependence on the Holy Spirit. It's why we would memorize Romans 8 and start to build our lives around the Spirit's influence and leadership in the way that we are as people. Uh, one of the ones that we talked about was being a sent people, a sent people. The word uh, oftentimes used in the Bible is apostle, and it means sent one. Uh, we get the, the Latin word missio is the same word as the Greek word apostolos. So anytime we talk about a missionary, we're talking about an apostle. Biblically, they're the same, they're overlaid as the same concept. And sometimes we think, okay, apostles wrote scripture and missionaries go into foreign lands. And both of those miss the point of, those, uh, of what they are. Uh, apostles, missionaries, and sent ones are all the same thing. And we as believers want to understand our place as being sent. Being a part of Anthem, we would hope that you would hear it over and over and over and over, that there are elements of our life that are here for the specific, explicit purpose of carrying the gospel into this world. Jesus shared a couple of key scriptures with us. John 20, 21, he said, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now, you could think he was just talking to the disciples, but the fact that the disciples then sent out other disciples and those disciples sent out other disciples indicates that this was supposed to go generationally. Paul even shared to Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will teach others also. This idea of multiplication and sending was carried on. Jesus, in his great commission, one of his last moments with his disciples said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Judea, uh, sorry, in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The picture of us being missionaries, sent ones, and apostolic people is everywhere. It's what we are as Christians today. So much so that we would go so far as to say, it's why you're still here. If you think about it this way, life can be kind of difficult. Sometimes people show up in church and they look around and they think everybody's got it together except for me. They're all doing just fine. Life is just humming along for everybody here except me. And I'm having a hard time. The challenge is that just about 100% of the people in the room are saying that exact same thing. We feel like we're the only ones having a hard go at it, but the truth is that life is full of challenges. Resistance, difficulty, sickness, pain, betrayal, frustration, over and over and over. We all experience it. So why are we still here? If it's difficult and God could so easily start our eternity today, why are we still here? I even think as an evangelistic strategy, if somebody said yes to Jesus and whoom, they were gone and their clothes were just on the ground, that would be an effective evangelistic strategy for anybody that was feeling like they had a hard time. They just say Jesus and boom, they're gone. Why is that not the plan? God. <laughs> I wasn't mean, didn't mean to sound sassy to God in that moment, but the reality is we are here because God has said, actually, the way that I want to reveal myself to the world is through you. I want the world to see that I am by you being filled up, transformed, coming together in unity, and living on mission. It's showing the character of God out in the world. That's the plan. That's the plan of the gospel advancing. For whatever reason, God chose us to be his means of communicating his character, his goodness, and ultimately his salvation to this world through you and me. So we look at something like that and we think, okay, well, I don't necessarily like telling people about Jesus. We're in a world that it's not uh, a good thing to be a Christian, 
You know, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, you could say that you're a Christian and it might get you a spot on a board or it might help you just reputationally, you were seen as a better person if you were a Christian. That's not necessarily the case anymore. We're viewed as bigots, we're hateful, or you say you're a Christian and people associate you with the biggest four-letter word in the history of four-letter words, evangelical, and they're just like, okay, you're on the other side. You don't belong with a voice or an influence into my life. And those things are uh, hard for us because then we oftentimes will pull back. And what ends up happening is then people that will tell the gospel do it in a very aggressive way and then the rest of the church oftentimes just lives out their faith quietly and feels like they're not the person to share. Well, Paul in Romans has taken this view of Israel and he's told some stories about Israel. He shared his heart about Israel. And it causes him to get to this point to talk about how will Israel and honestly, how will everybody experience salvation? And he takes a moment to talk about what it looks like for us to be a sent people. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So to start, I want you to take your Bibles and open them to Romans 9. We're not going to be in Romans 9 today, but I want to start with one passage from Romans 9. Verses 1 through 4, 1 through 3. Paul writes in Romans 9, 1 through 3. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. So all three of those are like, just know that the words I'm about to tell you are absolutely my heart. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers and sisters, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I want you to think of how serious this language is for just a minute. Imagine your spouse came home from work and they told you, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Just imagine that that were happening. You'd probably be on the phone with a therapist, probably be looking for some help. Like, that's real, serious, heavy language. For somebody to carry that kind of language and to share that, that is a big deal. I have great sorrow. We don't use this word very often when we talk about people in the Bible, but there's an element of depression connected to what Paul is talking about. I have great Sorrow, unceasing anguish. I'm in turmoil, inner turmoil, because my people, they don't have the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Now, for a lot of us, we looked at, at Paul's understanding of Israel, and it feels old, it feels ancient. You look at that and just think, okay, that's one man and his people but why is that so important? And while Paul carries this burden for Israel, he doesn't expect that everybody carry the same burden for Israel, but he does expect that, that the burden that you carry affect you and change the way that you live. So that's where we're going to fast forward to chapter 10. And we're going to talk about how this great sorrow and unceasing anguish move Paul to action to change the way that he lives in order to see these people come to faith in Jesus. So if you had, now if you could switch over to chapter 10, we're going to look first at verse 1. Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, talking about Israel, is that they may be saved. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Now here's the thing Paul's been sharing all throughout Romans, is that this doctrine of the gospel of Jesus is absolute true. Like it, it is something that you can bank on and it has both extreme positive implications but also very negative consequences to it. So the way that Paul would understand salvation is that everybody falls short of the glory of God. Everybody's in need of a savior. This is chapters one, two, and three. God put Jesus forth as a propitiation, one of the most important words in the whole Bible. He put Jesus into this place where Jesus would receive all of God's wrath towards sin, and God has wrath towards sin. All of God's wrath towards sin would be unleashed on Jesus so that anybody who declares their faith in Jesus would be covered by Christ, and they would not experience the wrath of God. 
But the implications of that are that anybody that does not have faith in Jesus still experiences the wages of their sin. And Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. It tells us in chapter 8, for if you live by the flesh, you will die. Paul's telling us the, the negative consequences of not putting our faith in Jesus is that we're still responsible for our own sin. We're still carrying the judgment for our own sin. Jesus' death has not applied to our status and nothing has changed about us, so we are still guilty before God. And this causes Paul immense pain for people that he loves dearly and cares about, his fellow Israelites. Now something just to point out, oftentimes we'll look at Paul saying there's neither Jew nor Greek and we'll saying he's he's trying to wipe out culture. Like he's just trying to eliminate any differences. We're all just humans here. There's no, there's no ethnic difference. There's no racial difference. There's no culture difference or language difference. That's actually not the message that Paul brings when he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. He's not trying to eliminate the differences. He's trying to tell you that the gospel covers all of these people groups. But Paul will oftentimes emphasize even his own culture as a beautiful thing. And he would want you to do that same thing. As coming into Christ, you're not eliminating your own culture. And this is something that we've had to walk through in Nepal when we go and try and and minister to people of Hindu faith and they come to faith in Jesus. They actually have a very hard time distinguishing what's culture and what's religion. And they are in the process of even starting to parse that out and decide how do I get rid of the Hindu religion that I used to live by but maintain my Nepali culture as a follower of Jesus. It's challenging. You may have experienced it yourself. It can be challenging to walk through a cultural uh, adoption or maintenance but living a gospel-centered life. So Paul calls on, on this heart for the Jews. He says, I love them. I want them to know Jesus. And it moves him into action. He says, so I pray for them. My heart's desire is that they might be saved. Because if they're not saved, the implication is they are still in their sins. And they are accountable for their sins. And they will experience death. Not life. They'll experience death. This salvation thing is absolutely real. And it leads Paul to pray intensely for his fellow Israelites. So the starting point for today, I just want to ask, do you carry a burden for the lost? Do you carry a burden for the lost? I want to start by saying that this message is not designed to throw shame on where you have been, because there are a lot of us that are like, look, I got a full life. I don't like to think about all the stuff that's going on out there. I've got a lot to deal with in here. And so to think about people not knowing Jesus is overwhelming. So I don't think about it. I don't like to process through that. I don't like to think about people going to hell. I don't want to imagine eternal condemnation. I can't process the consequences of somebody not giving their life to Jesus. So I'm just going to put my head down and I'm going to try and live a faithful life and see what I can do. And we'll, we'll actually try and kind of ignore what's going on in the world. It's not that uncommon. It happens a lot. We think about all of the ills of the world and we, and, and we get totally overwhelmed by them. You think about gun violence, you can get totally overwhelmed by it. Think about the wars that are happening in Ukraine and Sudan and Syria. And uh, I mean, just there are multiple wars happening. There's usually one or two that we hear about at any given moment. There are multiple wars happening around the world and we can get overwhelmed by news. And so we just, we sort of like narrow our view. here's my encouragement to you is that if you have received the doctrine of grace, meaning you have received salvation through Jesus Christ with your gratitude for your own salvation should also come a longing for those that have not yet experienced that grace to come into the fold. See, Paul both celebrates his own salvation and laments those that have not yet experienced the grace of God. And he lives in the tension of both of those things all the time. And it changes him. It 
changes him to live in that tension. And the reality of why we are still here is that it should change you to live in that tension. It should drive you to prayer to acknowledge that there are people that you love, that you know, that don't yet know Jesus and will experience the full consequence for their sin if they don't come by faith to Jesus Christ himself and experience salvation. It's heavy. It's hard to hold on to. But if we don't, Paul will go on to say, nobody else will. That's why we're still here. So let's take a look at 10. We're going to look at verses 8 through 17. And Paul's equipping us to be a sent people. That's what 8 through 17 are doing. He's equipping us to be a sent people. Now, the first thing I want to acknowledge as we get into this, uh, let, actually, let's read through the whole text, and then we'll point out a couple of things. So 8 through 17. Paul says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then the questions. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Okay, the first thing I want to point out is that Paul is actually bringing the storyline of Israel into an evangelistic world today. Just to explain this for a moment. He's using the Old Testament to show us that this was always the blueprint of God. So just a couple of these passages with their Old Testament uh, uh, tags on them. Can you throw those up there? Even if it's one by one. Deuteronomy 30 was the first one. It's helpful if I point it out up there. All right. Deuteronomy. We got it? Whoa, that is a new graphic. You guys are amazing. All right, now I got to work on this for just a second. All right, so if you look at this, this makes me look like a crazy YouTuber. All right, so take a look right now. Okay. All right, first up, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, is a draw from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 10. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Isaiah 28, 16. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved is Joel 2, 32. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news is Isaiah 52, 7. And Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us is Isaiah 53, 1. That's not accidental. That's not Paul just kind of winging it, writing up a bunch of stuff and saying, oh, look at that. It sounds just like the Old Testament. This is Paul telling you God's plan has always been to bring the Messiah through Israel to go to the nations so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone meaning Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will experience the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That was the Old Testament promise of God. And that's what Paul's doing with this section. Okay, so I wanted you to see that because it's kind of overwhelming to see that. Now let's take a look at some of these individual sections. First of all, Paul starts off with this idea that the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. So he takes a section from Deuteronomy 30 verse 10 and he puts it in the New Testament and he says, look, this prophecy from Deuteronomy is the word of faith that we proclaim. He's telling you that the gospel of Jesus is exactly what Moses was talking about when he said that the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Now Paul shared, I have this desire and I pray for them that they may be saved. And now he's coming to you he says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. 
He's actually telling his Roman audience, you are a sent people brought to bring the good news to people that don't yet know it. And what he's telling you is really important. He's telling you that you might not think you know the gospel, but it is closer than you could ever imagine. Okay, being a pastor, sometimes I get to sit down for coffee and talk with people about life or uh, how to share their faith or that type of thing. It's just one of the roles that I get to play being in the job that I'm in. And one of the most common things that I hear when it comes to evangelism is that I don't really feel like I know this stuff well enough to tell anybody else. If I open my mouth, I'll do more damage than good. So I'll just kind of stay put and let other people do the sharing and I'll kind of keep to myself. Or, uh, yeah, I preach the gospel all the time. I use words if necessary. They're never necessary, so I just show people that I love Jesus by how I live. And these things, well, there is a demonstration of the gospel that's a part of what we do. Paul wants us to wrestle with the fact that people need to hear the word of God. And they need to hear it from you. And it's closer to you than you think. You have the word of God by the spirit of God and you can share it. You're closer than you think. Peter tells us we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. And while you could go to Bible college and seminary, you could go through training on how to do evangelism, you could go through training on how to uh, prophesy or pray for people or encourage people on the streets, you could go through all kinds of training. There's always continuing education. (laughs) Today, you have what you need to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ because you have the Spirit of God if you're in Christ. You have it. You have it. You have the Spirit. You have the Scriptures, and the Spirit brings to remembrance all the things that Jesus taught us. That's one of the ministries of the Spirit. He actually reminds us of the things that Jesus taught. And you have the church. The church is an asset given to the world to equip one another for works of ministry. Read Ephesians 4. It's why the church is here. We're here to mutually stir each other up to be better equipped to do the things that God has asked us to do, like go and make disciples. So these things that we do on Sunday mornings, this kind of sermon thing is designed to be an equipping for you. Okay, a little little story in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 is a very famous passage, 242. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to the prayers. It's a great passage in the early church. I love it. Lasts for about 6 to 18 months where all of these believers are together in Jerusalem. It's a beautiful season. There's thousands of them. It's the world's first mega church. They're all there in Jerusalem, loving each other, generous with each other. Things are happening. And then chapter 8, verse 4 There's a great persecution that arises, and everybody scatters except the apostles. Acts chapter 8 tells us that everybody left Jerusalem except the apostles. The sent ones stayed, and everybody else went. But here's the thing that it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. It says, and they all went out preaching the word. The time that they were in church was an equipping time where they were learning to be preachers of the word so that when this persecution arose, every single one of them went out as preachers of the word. That's the dream of this. Just so that you know, I want to state it point blank, no doubts. I am here to equip you to go out as preachers of the word. Our dream would be that if something were to ever happen to this place, People don't just shift over to another church and go find another place to listen. You go out as preachers of the word. This is an important reality of what we're trying to do is equip you, shape in you the word of God that you could go out and proclaim God's goodness. All right. Uh, Thinking through the things that I wanted to teach through today, I had, I am the biggest dork on the planet. I'm terrible at acronyms. Terrible at acronyms, but there was one that made sense to me today, and so we're going to go with it. It's the word party, all right? So that's the thing. (laughs) Every Christian is supposed to party. Now, I realize the connotations that could carry, and I understand the difficulty of saying that out loud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain this acronym, and we're going to walk through it. But this is ultimately Paul equipping us to be people that proclaim the word of God. And this is important. If you're a part of Anthem, 
you will be uncomfortable if you don't feel like being sent. Because we believe it's core to being a follower of Jesus to be sent. And we talk about it all the time. Doesn't mean there's not moments of, uh, of healing or of recovery or of stepping back into a brief moment of, of like getting equipped or those types of things. But the general big picture, our whole life is given to the go, to the send. Okay, so the first one I was thinking through is pray, right? Romans 10.1, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them. Do you have a prayer list of people in your life that are not followers of Jesus? If not, write one. Could be three, could be eight, could be 10, could be a baker's dozen, 13. I worked at Western Bagel. Could be a baker's dozen. Pick your number, write your list, keep it in your bedside table, put it in your Bible, put it on your fridge, wherever you want to put it. Pick a day of the week. Thursday is my day that I pray for the lost, and I pull out my list and I pray for them by name. Do you have a burden that you carry for those that don't yet know Jesus? If not, cultivate it through praying for them. And do it purposefully. Sometimes we think, okay, Thursday will be my day for the lost. I'll sit down and I'll just pray for people, whoever comes to my mind. Honestly, do that after you've prayed for your list of people that God has entrusted to you that don't yet know Jesus. Write a list and be intentional about praying through it. What you'll find is that your desire will follow your discipline. My heart's desire and prayer is that they might be saved. For some of us, we don't carry a heart's desire that the lost will be saved. Well, how do you cultivate that? You cultivate it by praying for the lost. So start with the discipline of praying for people that don't yet know Jesus. And by the way, I love that language of don't yet know Jesus. I'm an optimist. I think God wants everybody in his kingdom. God desires that all mankind would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's 1 Timothy 2.2 or 2.4. Sorry, I forget which one it is. So I know God's desire is for everyone. He wants that everyone would be saved. So write your list and start praying through it. That's the P. The second is ask. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, party. That's right. Ask. (laughs) Ask God for opportunities to share your faith with people. As you're starting to pray for that list, you might notice people on that list, like a family member or like a friend or like a coworker. And if you start to ask, Lord, would you open up a door for me to speak? I believe the Lord loves to answer those prayers. If you've ever wanted to see answered prayer, start by praying for opportunities to share the gospel. He answers that prayer all the time. It doesn't always happen in the way you think or in the timing you think, but he answers that prayer all the time. It's why you're here. So he's going to pave ways for you to share the gospel. And what asking does is it starts to prepare your mind to look for him to move. You're actually starting to look for the answer to that prayer. You're shaping in your mind how God is going to answer that prayer. You're starting to see it and look for it. So ask for opportunities to share your faith. Okay, the R is ready. Ready yourself with the gospel. I know that I told you that you have it, and you do. You have the Spirit of God. At the same time, there are very helpful things like, have you ever written out your story with Jesus as the hero? Like, just taking a moment to write out a one-page testimony of your life with Jesus as the hero of your personal story. Have you ever written that out? If not, do it. Ready yourself. How would you respond if somebody asked this about your hope or about your joy or about your peace or about your faith? Have you ever, like, worked through those answers? Do you ever talk about it at the dinner table or get together with roommates and say, hey, I'd like to share my story with you. Would you give me a little feedback on this? Are you doing things to ready yourself so that when the opportunities come, it's free-flowing? It's not something that you've been nervous about for 25 years but never done anything about. You're actually preparing for those opportunities. Ready yourself. The Spirit works through our disciplines often. It's why we would memorize Romans 8 or read through the scriptures in a year or uh, whatever the things are with the scriptures. The Spirit brings things to our remembrance. Also, when we discipline ourselves to meditate on the scriptures, the Spirit speaks through that. It's kind of a a wild thing. He actually works through our discipline. Ready yourself by being familiar with the scriptures. 
being familiar with your own testimony. Be ready. All right, the T is tell. Tell somebody that you are a Christian. I don't know what happened to Christendom in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, but we thought our best strategy was I'll take 15, 20, 25 years to really get to know this person, and then maybe I'll talk to them about Jesus. And we are playing the long game with a lot of our friends in relational evangelism that never gets to the evangelism part. It's just relational. Do people know that you're a follower of Jesus? Now, you can very easily get obnoxious about telling people that you're a Christian. Sorry if you have the bumper sticker, but in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Is not an effective way of telling people that you are a Christian. Telling people you're a Christian is not just dropping it in randomly or being very obnoxious about announcing it. It's incorporating the fact that you are a person of faith into the way that you speak. Think about this for a second. Let's say you've had a friend for 20 years and you've never told them you were a Christian. Okay? It's happened to a lot of people, trust me. It's more common than you would think. Let's just take that same scenario that you have a friend for 20 years and you've never told them you were married. Okay, they never knew where you went most of the time. They didn't know who you spent your time with. You would just sort of appear and hang out with them and then go away. You didn't talk about, about whole sections of your life that seem really important, but they didn't know why. And then you land that information on them and say, ah, so Kristen and I have actually been married for 22 years. It's kind of a big deal in my life. And they're just like, why didn't you tell me? This is who you are if you're a follower of Jesus. So we actually invite people into who we are if we love them. And if you're curious about how to do this, just a very simple thing. If somebody asks how you're doing, how's your week going? How are you doing? Develop an answer of something like, man, you know, it's been a crazy week, but God's really sustaining me through it. I've been going to him, reading some scriptures, and it's actually changing how I think about the stuff that I'm going through. Incorporate into your answer the things that are true that you're going through in your life and let people into this asset, this resource, this beautiful treasure that you live with that they don't. What does Paul say in Romans uh, 12, 10, 12? The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. So if you call on the name of the Lord, a.k.a. you are saved, he has bestowed his riches on you. And he wants to do the same for your friend or your family member or your roommate or your coworker. But so often we just kind of keep that back. Like, I don't think they would really want it. Tell somebody you're a Christian. Begins to open up conversations. Some people, they shut it off. That's fine. The reality is we are the aroma of Christ, whether we want to be or not. If you are in Christ, Paul tells the Corinthians, you are the aroma of Christ. To some people, it's the smell of life, and they're drawn in. To others, it's the stench of death, and they run away. You can't control how people are going to react to Jesus in you, but they do need to know Jesus in you. And the reality is if they're friends with you, They already see Jesus in you. They just don't know how to articulate it. They're drawn to you not because you're an amazing person or you're funny or you're good at trivial pursuit. They're drawn to you because of Jesus in you. They experience his peace when they're around you. They experience his love when they're with you. They want what you have. They just don't know what it is that you have. You can speak about it. And the last part of this party is why. Yes, if the Lord gives an opportunity for you to go deeper with the gospel, you say yes. Predetermine in your heart that if somebody were to ask you a follow-up question to some of these things related to your faith or your life or your hope or your joy or your struggle or your trials or your endurance or whatever the things are that they pay attention to, if they ask questions and want to go to a deeper place, you say yes. If the Spirit puts on your heart a prophetic word for somebody and says, hey, I actually want to pierce this heart right now, say this. Say yes. If the Spirit is speaking to you, say yes. 
You predetermine in your heart an answer. It's something that, that I mean, I just think of life. You, you kind of got to figure this out. You know, if you're a young person that doesn't want to party, not this kind of party, but the other kind of party, and you know you're going into a social situation where there's going to be a lot of stuff thrown at you, you have to predetermine your answer or you're just going to slip right into whatever happens around you, right? You just kind of go with the flow and there you're right back where you were. You didn't want to be there, but you're saying the wrong answer, the answer that you didn't want to say because you didn't predetermine an answer. Predetermine an answer to when the Holy Spirit says, hey, I've got something for you to do. And tell him. Holy Spirit, today, whatever you ask me to do, I'm already in. I'm going to go, whatever it is. You guys want to know the weirdest one that ever happened to me? All right, weird, weirdest one. I said this same prayer, Holy Spirit, whatever you say, I want to do it. I was commuting to uh, Talbot Seminary, and I would take the train to, is it called Grand Central Station in L.A.? I would take the train to the main train station, Union Station. And then I would take it the rest of the way down to the La Mirada Station. I'd ride my bike up to um, uh, Biola and then back to the train and back home. It was a long day. So I would take the train through Union Station, and I had my bike. And this was when Yogurt Land was just coming out. And I really like frozen yogurt. And there was one in, I think, Little Tokyo or, uh, yeah, one area in L.A. And I would ride, I would ride my bike fast because I only had 24 four or five minutes between my trains, I would ride my bike fast to go get a yogurt land because I really, (laughs) thank you. So I was there and uh, there was a homeless guy and it doesn't always involve homeless people, but there was a homeless guy that was there and it was one, you know, like you ride by, you drive by, you walk by homeless people all the time. Sometimes the Lord puts something on your heart, sometimes he doesn't. In this particular situation, it was like, I mean, like that one of those sound waves just hitting my chest, like bass at a concert where I couldn't avoid, where he just said, buy him a sandwich and talk to him. Okay, so there's a subway next to the, uh, next to the yogurt land. I got my yogurt, and then I got him a sandwich. It doesn't mean you can't do what you want in the midst of saying yes to the Lord. I'm just saying. It wasn't like I had to switch to meatball all of a sudden. That wasn't in my brain. I got him a sandwich, and I sat down. We ended up talking. I missed that train, got the next one, but we ended up talking for a while. And it was just one of those situations. I I don't know what the eternal fruit of that moment was, but I actually, at times, have kind of processed this with the Lord and just said, was that more about my obedience than even the fruit in in his life? Because I don't know. I'll never know. I didn't catch his name. We talked about real things. We talked about life. We talked about God. We talked about all kinds of things. Took about 20 or 30 minutes out of my day. Definitely rerouted my day. It was, a, it was a weird day, but it was one of those yeses that I felt like I couldn't avoid, and I said, I said yes. Those kinds of things will happen about as often as you present yourself to the Lord. There's a, a book out uh, by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Have you guys seen this book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry? It's one of those books where you could read what's in it, but the title is kind of enough where you're like, okay, I get it, John Mark, thank you. <laughs> it's one of those ones where you look at that and just think, if, if I'm so full with my life that I never give the Holy Spirit license to invite me into a moment, then I'm going to miss all the moments. So we start to reshape our lives around a yes to the Holy Spirit. We start to reorient our lives about why we're here. Pre-saying yes to the Holy Spirit sets you on mission every single day. These are just things to try and shape in our hearts that reminder of this is why we're here. This is what we're here to do. A couple of things just to, to point out. For us as a church, our dream is to equip and send. Okay, so Paul says these things. He says, how are they to hear? Sorry. How will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Quick note on preaching. That's not pulpit. This thing wasn't invented for four or 500 years uh, after the origin of the church. Preaching is heralding. It's telling. This is not talking about a sermon like on a Sunday morning. It's talking about you speaking the gospel. How are they to preach unless they are sent? 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach or herald the good news. Paul's trying to craft in us a um, if then. If we have a burden for the lost, then logic says that we'd be the ones that preach. For us as a church, we want to be a sent church. We don't want that to be the obstacle. So we want to be people that are sending at all times. And so the things like the Thailand trip, Anthem Anywhere coming up in a few weeks, prayer uh, walk, these are designed to be equipping spaces. They're not just one-offs. They're not the end game. They're actually designed to cultivate in you activity that moves us towards what God has for us. We'll try and put these things in as often as we can because we we need constant reminders and shaping and growing. But the, the big picture hope for today is that we would be a people that understand that we are sent by God. And if not us, then who? That's, that's Paul's explanation. He could rest on the sovereignty of God and just be like, well, God's big and he's got a plan for Israel, so I'm sure he's going to tell them all about Jesus. But that would actually, that's not his view of sovereignty. God is big and has a plan, and we have a job to do. And somehow those both fit together. And so we need to take ownership of that responsibility and be people that are sent by God into this world. That's where that acronym comes from. I'm hoping you never forget it. I realize it's dorky. That's fine. I'll never do another acronym, I promise, until the next time. So uh, let me pray for us. Uh, Lord, thank you for today. Uh, Just pray that there would be a sense of readiness in us. Lord, would you craft opportunities in our community for us to be people that tell this world about your good news? Lord, I love the picture. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This has always been your plan. That there would be people that say yes to carrying your good grace into this world. So we pray for fruit in that. We pray for great conversations. Lord, I pray for the aroma of Christ to be permeating the Caneo Valley, Moore Park, and Simi Valley, and Agora, and beyond. Lord, would you fill this place with the aroma of Christ that we might see people who are being saved grab a hold of life. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to respond in a few ways. We're going to sing together and celebrate just the the joy and the reality of who God is. Also, we equip ourselves with the word by singing. These songs are designed to get in your head, to teach, to, to actually build up your knowledge of the things that are true about God. So we sing to remember, something that shapes our minds. We take communion as a central component of Uh, of being gathered as the people of Jesus. Uh, We have the elements here at two communion stations, and if you're new with us, people will start moving while we're singing and come take communion. And the way that we usually do it is you'll come and grab a cracker that represents the body of Christ given up for us, and then we have the cup that represents the cup of the new covenant. Jesus said, in my blood. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So for followers of Jesus, we take communion to recenter our lives on the finished work of Jesus. So if that's your story, if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you while we're singing to go take communion. You can do it as a small group or a family or a group of friends. We would love for that to be the case. If you're not a follower of Jesus, uh, please, you don't need to come up. It doesn't bear the same significance for you that it does for us. And we would hope that you would see just in this practice the centrality of Jesus in our lives and what is truly life-changing for us as followers of Jesus. So that's communion. Uh, We take offering. We have buckets available. We invite you to generosity. That's part of our story. We live off the generosity of the body, and we hope that you see the way that we live, that we are here to share the gospel with as many people as we come into contact with. And then lastly, we have a prayer area. We just want to encourage you, if you, uh, for any reason, could use some ministry this morning. Just... The word of God spoken over you, somebody praying for you, a specific situation that needs faith or encouragement. We would love to pray for you. So we have a whole area back there. You'll see people with name tags. And just while we're singing, you go back and you can ask to be prayed for and they'll encourage you in the Lord. So that's our our time of response today. So we'll spend the next 15 or so minutes just responding to the Lord. So let's stand up and let's uh, worship together.